Would you please welcome President Ruth Watkins of the University of Utah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's such a pleasure to be with you and to have the opportunity to welcome you to the 28th annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation. I want to extend a very warm welcome on behalf of the University of Utah to members of the Eccles family, to trustees of the Emma Eccles Jones Foundation, to our students, to our faculty, staff, alumni, and special guests, and of course, to members of the business community. We're just delighted that you could be here. Particularly, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Gail Miller on behalf of the entire University of Utah. Gail, your history of support for the university and service to our community, quite remarkable. Uh, we're so pleased to be able to have you as the convocation speaker today. Uh, so each year as we gather on this occasion to honor Spence Eccles for the vital role that he played in working with his aunt, Emma Eccles Jones to establish a $15 million endowment that has benefited our David Eccles School of Business since 1991. That generous gift and the naming of the school paid tribute to Mrs. Jones' father and Spence's grandfather, David Eccles, one of the leading figures in the economic growth both of the state of Utah and the Pacific Northwest at the turn of the century. It is an honor for the David Eccles School of Business to bear the name of this visionary entrepreneur. While I have enjoyed previous Spencer Fox Eccles convocations over the past several years, this year holds special meaning for me personally. It's my first year in the role of university president. What a tremendous honor it is for me to represent the U here today and to be able to acknowledge the success and the growth of the David Eccles School of Business. A critical part of that growth and that success has been the product of Emma Eccles Jones Endowment. This endowment gift has provided more than $20 million to the business school, funds that have enabled the development of innovative programs, scholarships that attract the strongest students and help keep those students with us through graduation, and funds that help us attract and support faculty uh, faculty that are coming to us from the best institutions in the nation and succeeding here at the David Eccles School of Business. This has been a catalyst for growth in this school and I want to particularly acknowledge and thank the trustees of the Emma Eccles Jones Foundation for helping us make this excellence happen at the University of Utah. Clark Giles, I'm not sure if Clark's with us today. If he is, would he stand up? No. Um, I did see Bob Hatch. Bob Hatch is with us. We recognize Bob Hatch. And Spencer F. Eccles. Um, we thank you for your continued support and improvement of support of this entity. You have made great things happen at the University of Utah, and we appreciate you. Let's recognize them for their support. <laughs> I would like to also take just a minute to uh, give my warmest thanks and appreciation to Spence Eccles and to the members of his family. You have supported tremendous things at the David Eccles School of Business and at the entire University of Utah. You're a critical partner in our endeavors here. You make great things happen at this institution. We are deeply grateful for the commitment of time, support, resources, great ideas that contribute to this fine institution, as well as our state and our city. So big thanks to you, members of the Eccles family, yes. And now it's my pleasure to turn the time to Dean Taylor Randall. I think I know as well or better than anyone of the progress that has happened at the David Eccles School of Business under Taylor's leadership. The school has increased uh, in terms of number, growth, in terms of students and faculty, but more importantly in terms of quality and in terms of impact. The innovative programs that are supporting student learning and uh, investing in the workforce of the future are remarkable, as is the scholarship of our noteworthy faculty. Taylor, you've done great work here. It's a pleasure to turn the time to you.
Thank you, President Watkins. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. This is a very exciting day. We get to hear from one of the most successful and celebrated Utahns, Gail Miller. Um, I know how important it is to have strong female leadership in a community, and it's been remarkable to see the way she works behind the scenes to make all of our lives much, much uh, better. We're honored to have you here today, Gail. And President Watkins, thank you for being the first female president of the University of Utah. <laughs> increasing women enrollment and also increasing women leadership in our community is one of our large goals as a, as a business school. I can't think of two better role models to have here today. Thank you very, very much. Well, welcome everyone to the Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation. This is one of the fun moments of the year when we get to hear from remarkable business leaders and it's just a wonderful opportunity to have Gail with us here today. We've had many leadership changes here at the University of Utah, new president, new vice presidents, new athletic director. Sometimes that makes things a little bit nervous, but you know what, the university has never been better and we're always we always feel comfortable and stable because we've got a lot of secret sauce here at the University of Utah. And a lot, that secret sauce uh, happens to be students and alumni and donors and people like you that are always here supporting us. But I would say the base ingredient to our super secret sauce is actually Spence Eccles. Um, many of you know him as a philanthropist, a great business leader, a leader in this state, a dedicated family man, perhaps the most loyal Ute fan any of you will ever see. Uh, Spence Eccles has long supported uh, our school in some remarkable ways. He graduated from the University of Utah in the modest year of 1956 and for over six decades has supported this university and especially this school in some just foundational ways. Would you please welcome Spencer Fox Eccles. Good morning, good morning to all of you. My goodness sakes alive. Well, thank you, President Watkins and Dean Randall for your kind introduction remarks over the top. And I gotta tell you all, really I'm very thrilled to participate in our events today, now as part of this, as we've said, the 28th Annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation. And I must admit, the fact that we're now just two years away from the Convocation's 30th anniversary, it amazes me. I guess time really does fly when you're having fun, huh? <laughs> and again, each year on this occasion, with the, the students helping to kick off the academic year each time, uh, it's a real pleasure to have us uh, reflecting on the remarkable accomplishments of my grandfather, and business school namesake, David Eccles, as an entrepreneur and businessman. And on the generosity and foresight of my Aunt Emma Jones, and Emma Eccles Jones, who established the endowment in his honor and memory that continues to enrich the school under the leadership of Dean Randall's ever ready baton of leadership. I believe they both, Granddad and Aunt Em, would be proud of the legacy this school has created and continues to create by educating, mentoring, and shaping the future of tens of thousands of students. Oh yes, you students here today, and I truly hope you follow the example because you'll be carrying on this legacy of David Eccles through integrity, high ethical standards, innovation, hard work, and most of all, dedication to your communities and your country, the good old U.S. of A. And so today I'm thrilled to say that our distinguished convocation presenter, Gail Miller, truly epitomizes the, uh, of all of that and even much more. Gail is the owner of Larry H. Miller Group of Companies and the chair of the board of Larry H. Miller a management company. And hot off the press, she just completed her autobiography, Courage to Be You, Inspiring Lessons from an Unexpected Journey. And that's exactly where 
she's been and what she's part of now. It's a great story, I'll tell you. Well worth the read. She and her late husband, Larry, started their business with a single, a single Toyota dealership in 1979, just shy of 40 years ago. And you might uh, want to know she owns the first car she ever bought. A 1963 Red Ford Falcon Sprint Convertible, the one her then boyfriend, Lawrence, wanted her to have so he could drive it and race it. <laughs> uh, true love at its best, uh, Gail, eh? <laughs> but she can fill us in more on the story, I'm sure, but suffice it to say, she went to the dealership wanting a Ford T-Bird that was advertised in the newspaper. But she left, yes, she left with the Ford Falcon, her boyfriend, Larry, wanted. You know, you know, Gail, you must have realized at that time my good friend Larry Miller was quite a salesman. <laughs> but I digress, I, I digress. What's more important is that through their hard work, ethics, and dedication, the Larry H. Miller group of companies now employs more than 10,000 people and includes more than 60 dealerships throughout the West, as well as the Utah Jazz, the Salt Lake City Stars, the Salt Lake Bees, and a major theater complex of many theaters and a variety of other successful companies. The Millers are also known for their tradition of giving back to the communities where they do business through their Education Foundation and their Family Foundation that support many, many charitable, educational and humanitarian causes. But Gail is incre incredibly uh, generous in sharing not only her financial resources, but also her time and her business savvy with the community as well, serving on the boards of Intermountain Healthcare, which she now chairs, the University National Advisory Council, and the Eccles Business School Kim Gardner Policy Institute, which she co-chairs and she recently retired as chairman of the Salt Lake Community College. Now, while you can read much more in the printed program about Gail and her many honorary doctorates and awards, let me just touch on a couple of things not mentioned there. You may recall seeing the, uh, the headline, the Deseret News back in March of this year, it said, Gail Miller is giving out thousand, got the decimal in the right place, uh, thousand dollar bonuses to her uh, her top line uh, employees and uh, it's terribly important that uh, as the first lady in business as they called that uh, I say thank you Gail now it goes on to talk about her desire to reward the company frontline employees with the true gesture of thanks for their commitment to the company's vision which is to make it the best place in town to work and the best place to do business. Always modest about these things. Gail's response to all the fuss about the bonuses was just to say, straightforward. It was the right thing to do. So Gail, I for one know it was just the right thing to do to invite you to share your thoughts with us this morning so we can all learn from the extraordinary example that you set. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming my friend and our Convocation keynote speaker, Utah's First Lady of Business, Gail Miller, and she certainly lives up to my own motto that the best is yet to come. Gail, the mic is all yours. Thank you, Spence. That was way too long. <laughs> but I'm grateful to you and your family for inviting me to be here today. Thank you, Ruth. I appreciate what you do to lead the Women's Charge. And to Taylor, you're great in what you do. I admire watching you. I love your free spirit. So thank you. It's an honor to be here today. And I hope that something I say will benefit you. I. I have just come from speaking to a group of wonderful students, so many of you might hear the same thing again. 
But I'm going to tell you a little bit. Oh, and by the way, Larry paid me back. I now own a lot of cars. <laughs> so no problem. <laughs> but just before Larry passed away, our youngest son, Brian, had a special conversation with him. Brian loved and admired his dad and wanted to be just like him. And he said to him, Dad, it will be my honor to live my life trying to be like you and measuring myself against you. Now that was an aspirational statement, but not one that should have been top of his mind. Larry said to him, son, don't measure yourself against me. Measure yourself against yourself. That is enough. And to you students, I would say to you today, measure yourself against yourself. Do the things that are important to you to be able to reach your full potential and to create goodness in the world wherever you go. I think there's a risk in measuring ourselves against others, whether they're parents or mentors or other heroes. We are each unique in our own way and Larry gave him good advice that day. It freed Brian up to be able to become the best individual he could be. And of course, he's still working on it. He's young, but he isn't always wondering about, am I doing what dad would do? He can be himself and he can develop the potential that he has inside of him. Every one of us needs that opportunity. One of the things that I would like to talk about today is gratitude. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos to order, confusion to clarity. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend, Gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. Quoted by Melody Beatty. I think gratitude is important because it gives us perspective. It creates hope and it gives us courage that every new day will have something good in it to cling to, even when we're experiencing difficulties in our life. Gratitude can unlock our minds to an abundantly rich environment. Now looking through that lens, I can clearly see that one of the most beneficial qualities that I've developed is courage. Courage has helped me to look forward, it's, but it's also helped me to look inward and face my fears and challenge my trials. Courage has helped me to look outward and to welcome the future. I've been able to use my courage to grow and expand my talents and my potential as opportunities have come my way. And with that perspective, I've worked hard to create a life of purpose, direction, and satisfaction. Sometimes when we look back over our lives, we tend to categorize our experiences into two columns, those that were good, that provided rich memories and those that were bad or hard, the ones that we would rather forget. Well, I've found that I want to remember the lessons that I've learned from both columns and not dismiss the hard times just because they're unpleasant and painful, because they're the ones that made me strong. Every experience has a purpose and often we don't appreciate or understand what it is at the time. Many times it's only after the pain is gone that we can see the reason for the hardship and the strength that it brought into our life. Now I know that my life prepared me for what I'm doing today. Larry and I were in our mid-30s when we bought our first dealership in Murray, Utah. We had five children and we'd been working in Colorado for the previous eight and a half years. We had a great employer and he had five sons and he wanted them to learn everything they could from Larry as Larry had advanced in his company from a parts manager to a general manager to an operations manager. 
but he wanted his sons to take over the business. So he called Larry one day and he said, would you go back to the Toyota store, don't take a cut and pay, but go back to the Toyota store and teach my sons the car business. Well, interestingly enough, Larry was willing to do that. He was always a teacher. He wanted to be able to impart whatever he could, wherever he could, to whomever he could. But when the plan was presented to Larry, he realized his career was coming to an end in Colorado. But he agreed to do what he was asked. So in April of 1979, we came to Utah for a vacation. Larry often met with an old friend who owned a Toyota store here, and he would go to lunch with him. Many times he would ask him the question, when are you going to sell me your dealership? Well, the timing was just right that day, and as they were getting up from lunch, he said, how about today? <laughs> Larry said, great. They sat down, talked about the deal points, went back over to the dealership, wrote out the contract on the bottom of a check, and on May 1st, Larry was in that store running it with 30 employees, thinking that that was going to be what we would do for the rest of our lives. And we moved back to our home state. Well, there have been a lot of major events in our life, but at the time, there were not very many that were more significant than that one. Maybe the day we got married, I don't know. <laughs> but that began a journey that neither one of us could have ever imagined. We went from there to buying a few more dealerships in the next few years just because we had opportunities that came our way, not thinking that we were expanding into something grandiose. But there were major, other major events in the history of our lives. That Toyota store was one. We now have torn the original store down, rebuilt it, torn that one down, and rebuilt another one. So life goes on, things expand. Then we had the purchase of the Jazz One in 1985, which was an interesting period in our lives. We were still struggling, hoping to be successful in what we were doing for a long time. But one day we received a call from Dave Chickets, who was the general manager of the Utah Jazz, because the Jazz were in trouble. They had come to Utah the same year that we did in 1979 and had never quite been able to get over the hump and become financially viable. Dave was looking for some investors. He was calling around to get 30 people to invest $100,000 each to give the Jazz a chance to secure their future. Larry said, I'm interested in helping, but I don't think that's the way to do it. Well, they wanted to learn more, so he came right down, talked to Larry, and they discussed the future of the Utah Jazz. Well, Larry came home to me and talked about this opportunity. <laughs> and I was scared when we bought our first dealership. I thought, how are we going to go from being an employee, being responsible for just ourselves, to being an employer responsible for the wages for 30 people and their families. So you can imagine when he came home with an offer of buying the Utah Jazz first half for $8 million, I thought, wow, <laughs> I do have confidence in you, but <laughs> we talked it over and we talked it over and he put figures on paper and he looked at at it every way he could imagine. He said, I think we can do this. Well, being the good wife that I was, I supported him in trying to do something good for the community. We had never been to a jazz game at that point. So we weren't buying it because we were fans of basketball. We were buying it because we knew that it was an asset that belonged in this community. And there were very few of them at the time. And if it ever left Utah, chances were very likely that we would never have another opportunity to have a major league, league basketball team in a small market like ours. So I understood the need to do something to keep it here. We had to determine how we were going to do that. Larry immediately started calling banks. <laughs> First security came online. They had already been heavily invested in the Utah Jazz, but they were willing 
to help us with a loan, as were some other banks. We met at a game, uh, the first game we went to. Well, actually, that's not true. We had gone in that interim to two other games with Sam Battistone, the other owner. He wanted us to have that rich experience. <laughs> so I was waiting at the game, and Larry was going to give me a high sign when he came in, whether he was able to get the, the deal done or not. And as he came in at the last minute, for the press conference, he gave me a thumbs up and I knew everything was okay. So we played a game that night and we won by more than we'd ever won, more than the Jazz had ever won by before. I think they were void up, but they now had an opportunity to have a secure future. The next year, the same thing happened. The Jazz were gonna leave Utah. Now, we paid $8 million for the first half. The next year, our half was worth $14 million. So Sam came to us and said, I have a suitor. Some people in Minnesota want to buy the team. And there were others. If, we, if you can't buy my half, I have to sell it. I can't afford to stay in it. So somehow, Larry determined a way to buy the second half. Two times, well, actually three times now, we put our lives on the line, buying the first dealership, buying the first half of the Jazz, buying the second half. But we did it. And we were committed, and we were able to make an investment in a community that we loved and keep the Utah Jazz here. This is probably a little known fact, but the first year we owned the team, the payroll for all the players was $2 million. <laughs> Today you can hardly get a rookie for that. <laughs> We soon realized that as the salaries were going to escalate, we needed to have more revenue income. So it was determined that now we would do it again, put everything we had on the line, and build a new arena. We had been playing in the Salt Palace. We needed to have more seats so that we had more people coming. We had more revenue to get better players to have more people come. So it's, it's a cycle that we understood and we did what we had to do by building an arena. Everyone thought we were crazy. Hardly anyone had any faith that it would work, but it did. It was a real growing experience for both of us. For about three years, I hardly saw Larry. He was digging this big hole and building as they were designing. It was quite an adventure. So that came along and then in, during that period of time, Larry developed diabetes. And diabetes is an illness that if you don't pay attention to it, it can get a hold and do really bad things to your body. And he was not one to spend time on himself. He was too busy doing a lot of other things and making uh, good investments in the community, doing things for other people, providing jobs, buying dealerships, taking care of whatever he needed to, but not himself. So by the time he realized he had diabetes, it was pretty advanced. And in June of 2008, Larry had a heart attack. He spent 59 days in the hospital. He thought he could go in and get better and come out and no one would even know he'd been gone. 59 days is a long time. He didn't recover well. He did get well enough to come out of the hospital, but life after that was one endless rounds of doctors, uh, doctor appointments, treatments, uh, optimistic things that didn't pan out. And in February of 2009, Larry passed away. Before he had his heart attack, he knew that he was going to have to slow down. So one day he called all of the boys, I have four boys and a daughter, called us all together and sat around the kitchen table, handed out a notebook and said, you're going to want to take notes. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know to run this company when I'm gone or when I step back. He was not planning to die anytime soon. He was going to retire. So we took notes for about a year and a half. And then in July of 2008, right at the time things were dropping in the economy, he named Greg the CEO and he determined that he would step back and let Greg have a run at the company. Greg did a really great job. He was well prepared. He did all the things that he needed to do and he was anxious to take over that job. 
The other boys were invested as well. Steve was running the sports and entertainment. Brian was running the uh, cultural piece. Roger was working in IT. So we were all working hard to create, um, keep the, the company going and, and to have a good future. Well, after about six years, Greg decided that he would step down. But before he did, I thought, I need to know what's going on because Larry was always downloading to me and telling me every day all of the things that he was doing at work. Even though I was a stay-at-home mom raising kids, I needed to know what was going on. So I decided that I would go and sit in on Greg's meetings. So I attended a nine o'clock meeting every morning. There would be one for sports and entertainment, one for automotive, one for real estate, and every one was exciting. And what I learned was, this is really fun. <laughs> Business is great, and I'm sure you all know that because you're, <laughs> you're dealing with it every day. But it was fun for me, and I had not had that experience. I was a stay-at-home mom for 44 years because I raised a grandson from the time my first son was born till my grandson left home was 44 years. And then I had an opportunity to step into the business. So my job, as I saw it at the time, was not to be the CEO. We were able to turn the reins of CEO over to one of our employees who had been our CFO, who had been with us for 28 years and worked hand in hand with Larry all that time. He understood us, he was able to carry on, and he, he's there today, Clark Whitworth, and he's doing a great job. I did not need to step in and run the company. What I needed to do was to make sure our future was secure. During the time Larry had been involved, he was adamant about creating security. He had done everything he could to make all of our companies financially stable and set up his estate plan so that it would last for 80 to 100 years. When I stepped in, I realized there was no plan for that to happen. So I realized quickly that I needed to do a succession and transition piece. I also needed to do a cultural piece. We had a strong culture. We were built on a strong culture. But it wasn't in writing. It wasn't something you could see and touch and feel. So I engaged my youngest son, Brian, to help write a cultural piece because I, it, was, it was evident right away that our, bill, our business had grown a lot since Larry's passing. And many of our employees had never known him and never known how strong his culture was. So we needed to take the opportunity to solidify those principles and make them known throughout our company. We have four values. We have integrity, hard work, service, and stewardship. Those are the values that we hang our hats on. But going back to the transition and succession, Larry having secured the financial part of the company, I needed to worry about how are we going to do this for the next 80 to 100 years. To me, it's made sense to create a board of directors. So I created, I hired a man who had worked for us, who was an attorney named Danny Haslam, to be my advisor, to help me implement the things that I felt were important in our company to come to be. One of the first one of those was to create a corporate board. We have six independent directors from across the, the country, uh, very capable people, doing a wonderful job for us. We have four family members, myself included, with my three sons. We have a gray director and the CEO. We are working really well together, and our vision is for this company to last for a long time. I also felt like it was important for us to have family governance. So I've created a family office. I've created programs for my family, so in fact, I stole away one of your people to be our education specialist to get my family uh, from preschoolers on up educated in a way that they will be prepared to come on and be 
uh, ready to run this company so that we can remain a family-owned and family-run business for 80 to 100 years and beyond. So since Larry's death, we have doubled in size and revenue, and now the challenge is to prepare for the future and the changes that are coming, not just in our business, but in the whole arena of business. There are going to be major changes coming that we're needing to prepare for. Who knows what the automobile is going to turn into, what other companies there may be that we'd want to get into. We own 80 businesses today. We have a variety of opportunities for work. We have uh, two divisions, sports and entertainment, that has the Utah Jazz, the Bees, the Stars, the, uh, the arena, uh, the theaters. We have an automotive division that has over 60 dealerships with subprime uh, financing, insurance companies, uh, care products for your car. We've built businesses that complement our core businesses. So we employ almost 11,000 people. We've moved from 30 to 11,000. It's been an exciting time. It's an exciting time in the world. Larry created a wonderful foundation, and I'm grateful, this is where gratitude comes in, I'm grateful that I am able to carry on in a way that I can build on that foundation and prepare us for a future that will be extremely dynamic and diverse. It's a wonderful time to be in business. Today, as I look over my life, I recognize that I've had a wide range of experiences. Some are simple, some are complex, some are ordinary, and some are extraordinary. I've experienced everything from being a timid, unsure housewife and stay-at-home mom to being the owner of one of the largest, 200 largest privately owned businesses in the country. I'm confident that my experiences aren't any better or worse than any of yours, but they are mine and they are my life. I feel gratitude to the people who've helped me see the value in my life and encouraged me to share what I've learned with others. I'm humbled that my experiences seem to have more than one purpose. I've grown in unexpected ways. I've been enriched beyond my capacity to contain. I've learned abundant lessons with each trial and in retrospect, seen a guiding hand in every step that I've taken. These are the things that make what I have enough and more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe we have a few microphones. We've got uh, about 10 minutes for questions, if you'd like to ask Gail some questions. They're on each side. Gail, thank you so much for that beautiful message. Thank you. I have read your autobiography, and I just wanted to spotlight one part of it, if you'd be comfortable talking about it. But you talked about the value of seeking help when you need it in life and counseling. And you had kind of a clever comment where you said, if you even thought that you need counseling, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought it would just be helpful for you to share that with our group. I'd be happy to. She's talking about a time in my life where I had a child who needed some help. And so I took this child to a counselor. And as we were sitting there, he looked across at me and he said, I'm happy to help your child, but you're the one that needs help. <laughs> Now, it wasn't because I was broken, I don't think, but it was because there were so many things going on in my life, and Larry was working 80 to 100 hours a week. I was doing everything I needed to do and knew how to do, and I did need help. So I went to counseling. I went to counseling for 23 years. That's, <laughs> that's how hard life has been. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't just because of that one child. It was because 
going through life without help is like trying to heal a broken arm by yourself. You need help when you need help, and I recognize that. And during that period in my life, I was, I was rather insecure. And there was a time during that period where I couldn't even say my own name. If I was introduced to someone, I'd say, hi, I'm Larry Miller's wife. And I realized very quickly that that's not the way to live a fulfilled life. I needed to find out who I was and develop my own personality. And so I took the time to go to counseling, to develop my skills and my talents, be aware of who I was and where I was and what was going on in my life. I didn't go to college. I had one quarter here at the U. But the world has been my university, and I have learned a lot by watching and listening and hearing what other people do, watching the news, being engaged in the community, learning from my husband, learning how to do things that I'd never done before. It takes a lot of courage to say, I need help. And you have to overcome a fear that can really be debilitating. Because to admit that you need help sometimes makes you feel weak. But in the long run, it makes you strong. And that's part of what I was talking about in here. The things that we overcome make us better. They give us strength. So thank you. Any others? So I saw earlier this year you sold the jazz to a trust. Could you kind of walk us behind your thinking that to keep it in Utah for years to come? I can. I didn't sell it to the trust. I put it in a trust. It's called a legacy trust. And for many years, because the jazz had a hard time before we bought them, there was a question that used to go around saying, will they stay or will they go? And then even after we bought them, people were wondering, because the price went up so high, are they going to sell them and take the money and run? I'm sure they were thinking that, how can you avoid uh, capitalizing on that kind of a revenue? So the logical answer was, we are not ever going to sell them. It's a community asset that needs to stay here. It does a lot for our community. It helps with the economy. It helps with the downtown area businesses. It helps with the image of Utah across the world. And it's a good thing for our, for our community. It, it brings people together. You can be a University of Utah fan. You can be a BYU fan. You can be a Weber State fan. But when you come in the arena, you're a Utah Jazz fan. And it unites us with one cause. And I'm grateful for that. So the reason was I wanted to have uh, a secure place for the Jazz to be and put everyone's mind at ease that they are not going anywhere. We didn't ever intend to sell them, so the value of them was irrelevant. We just um, decided that whatever they are worth, they belong to this state, and we will do what we can to make sure they are a community asset. Biking? A little bit. And uh, I'm just curious why you decided to be involved with the tour of Utah. Yeah. So I'm guessing it's not a real money maker for you. <laughs> no, it's not. But there are a lot of cyclists in the room. But it is another unifying thing for this state. And it's, it's one of those ways we can give back. And we have a son that is a biker. And he's, he's enjoyed doing that. Now I have a grandson that did Lodija yesterday. And so it, it is something that, again, is good for our community. It shows that we care, that we come together, and that we have things we can enjoy together so that life's not all hard. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, the question is, how are we, what advice are we giving our children and grandchildren so that they will understand the value of education and help with our legacy? 
we're doing, uh, I've actually hired this man to come in and be a, an education specialist and career development person for my family. Uh, in the beginning, we had very few who were looking toward college, some but not all, and I felt like I need to change that attitude and move the needle and help them understand that you're not going to get along in this world without an education. And you're not going to be able to run a business you know nothing about until you know about the business. And you can't do that without having a solid foundation to learn on. So that's why I'm doing that. But we're involved in a lot of other ways with education. And I was seeing the people that we've been providing scholarships for uh, advance and, and listening to their stories. We have an enrichment scholarship here where we do 10 minority students every year who are mostly first-time attendees of the university or of any college, and their stories are incredible. They are so touching. We've had students that have been homeless. We had one that graduated this last year who was one of 11 children, the only one who had not been incarcerated. Those people are making a difference, and I felt like, they're getting it. Why, why aren't my kids getting it? <laughs> So I felt like the only thing I can do is force feed them. And if they, if they take it, great. They'll, they'll go far. And I hope they do. If they don't, there's nothing more I can do. But I can at least give them the opportunity. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very What a wonderful set of lessons for our alumni, students, faculty, and staff. Uh, I think a story of courage, uh, a story of lifelong learning, and certainly giving us all inspiration that we can do more for our families and for our community and our businesses. Thank you very, very much, Gail. It's our, uh, as a small token of our appreciation to you, uh, it's our tradition to, to name a scholarship uh, in uh, the name of our convocation speakers. So next year, one of our deserving uh, students will have uh, your name on their scholarship. So thank you very, very, very much. Thanks everyone for coming. We look forward to seeing you next year at the 29th annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation. Thanks everybody and have a great day.